Hello, my name is Louise Cole. I'm the Production Director at COGAP in Brighton in the UK. And today I'm going to be talking to you about making highly accessible 2D digital exhibitions for online storytelling. So storytelling. Great storytelling starts with great content, I think we'd all agree. Digital first or digital only exhibitions provide an opportunity to share the story of an exhibition but on beyond the audiences that would normally attend in your galleries. We saw this a lot during COVID, um, many, many requests to start getting exhibitions up in all their rich detail online. And I don't think it's something that's going away. Uh, we're seeing high levels of visitors online to exhibition platforms. Um, and it's a sort of complementary um, experience to the in-gallery one. Uh, they can take notice of the story in more detail in their own time. Uh, as, and unlimited access and also just it's a time barrier isn't it uh, getting getting to your favorite museum is not always easy and having these things at your fingertips online on institutional websites is of great value often when planning for a digital version of an exhibition it can often lead quickly to a representation of the physical galleries so 3D gallery tours absolutely have their place and there's fantastic tools out there. And this one here is using Matterport, which I know many institutions use, and they absolutely have their place and they are a really valuable tool um, to engage in, um, engage audiences in your exhibition online. So as do AR and VR experiences have their place, virtual reality, augmented reality, it's really exciting, it's really new and modern, and they really do offer something new to the audiences, particularly coming into the galleries, but it's sort of yet to be adopted in people's homes. Therefore, it can be a barrier. So considering both AR and VR alongside 3D gallery tours, both these offerings, it has to be acknowledged, have barriers to accessibility. AR and VR experiences often require specialist hardware, running specialist software to operate at all, and they're mostly limited for that reason to an in-gallery experience at the moment. 3D tours often require really complex navigation. Um, I think a lot of focus when someone's using a 3D gallery tour in the user testing we've done, it's really sort of confounded all in the navigation of moving around the galleries and less so in engaging with the material. And I think when you're trying to tell a story and a really compelling story, it needs to be an easy flow through the material that is presented. And I sometimes think a 3D gallery tour can be a bit of a barrier to that. The recreation of a physical exhibition, it often fails to utilize the different ways in which people would like to be shown the content. So you're able to freely move around and touch the touch points and see the objects in an order that you choose in the way that you might want around a gallery. But actually it might be a missed opportunity um, that a digital exhibition can offer a handheld view through the content in the way that the curator or the designer of the exhibition actually sees as a, an enhancement to it um, and, and in a way to open it up to more audiences that don't have the confidence to go and explore and maybe won't gain as much from something if they're just free reign. Um, the other aspect of 3D gallery tours that can be a little bit restrictive is the need for a high speed internet connection. So rendering a straightforward 2D web page is a, something that is available to many, many people around the world now. Uh, having a high speed internet connection to run a complicated 3D model may be more difficult to come by. So there are exclusionary issues in there. So what I want to talk about today is to demonstrate examples of online exhibition systems that really move away from this skeuomorphic view of online event exhibitions. So we're not trying to recreate a physical experience online. We are um, embracing the digital experience and all of the opportunities that that can offer in a way that actually can enhance um, someone's ability to engage with the content and uncover wonderful new things. So the, ex the exhibition examples that we're going to look at um, are all virtual exhibitions, but without the need for any 3D navigation 
or any um, specific technologies or hardware, they are essentially websites. So all three focus on being immersive because of the power of the content and the synergistic connections between the objects that have been put together for the exhibition, rather than being immersive because of a sort of surface level visual difference as in being 3D or being in a headset and looking like you're immersed in the 3D. Really, we want to focus on the power of the story rather than the power of the technology. So these projects all promote accessible versions of a digital exhibition. So anyone with any type of screen, an internet connected device could use these exhibitions. Everything's tested to WCAG AA standards and we'll come back to that a little while later. When I say accessibility in this talk, really I'm talking about um, access and opportunity for access rather than the technical policies of accessibility, but that is obviously of critical importance and has been considered in all of these. Um, so we're gonna go through the three case studies. We'll look at how the features involved can be implemented to maximize the power of storytelling. There are some ideas in here for 2D storytelling devices. So tools that you can use and ideas for design and layout that can help. Um, and some of which, or a lot of which, could be implemented by a non-technical team, which can be a benefit to smaller institutions. We also are going to look at how the 2D interfaces really do continue to have a valuable part to play in allowing as many people as possible to experience art and other objects in the most useful and engaging way possible. So first of all, I'll introduce the three projects. So these th three projects have all launched in the last two years um, and we COGAP have been lucky enough to build them. So the first there on the left is Giselle and this is a project called Glitch Giselle and it's a critical and creative exploration of a classic work, the dark 19th century romantic ballet Giselle. The project undertook a series of sub projects with one time or another, a group of professional dancers, a class of dance students, a secondary school down in Kent in the UK, a composer, a sound artist, a film editor, numerous scholars. And it also draws from the archives of the VNA, the British Library and the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So Glitch Giselle is presented in the form of deck of tarot cards. Each card represents one aspect of the work world of Giselle as seen through the lens of our project. So this immediately, the tarot card motif used on Giselle is something that adds a really unusual nature of navigation and there is no linear path through this content. Um, you could click on each one at a time and that's one way to do it, but actually the curators of this were really um, taken by the idea of this pure exploration. You click on something, it's unknown. Even when you've turned over the card as the one on the right there has been turned over, you're still like, okay, that's just an invitation. It's really about exploring at your own leisure and finding those serendipitous discoveries about what's gonna be behind this card. It feels very interactive and it has motifs in it that you would find in an in-gallery experience. Come and turn this page, come and view this with this device, but actually it's all just happening on your phone or on your laptop screen. So the second, case study I wanted to show you today is Shakespeare in the Royal Collection. Um, and this is one that was going to be a physical exhibition at the Globe. And um, the team from King's College London came to us to try and get this online in time for um, their exhibition launch, um, which we weren't sure at the time, which would be whether it would be happening in uh, the physical space or not. So this one explores the holdings of the UK Royal Collection in detail, but with a very specific lens. So it's to ask the connected questions. What has Shakespeare done for the Royal Family? And what has the Royal Family done for Shakespeare? So the interconnection between the two, which is something our English literature graduate had never thought about this uh, perspective on Shakespeare in this way and on the, on the sort of real life Royal Family in this way. Um, but it's a very interesting angle. So we partnered with King's College London and Birkbeck University of London to deliver this exhibition. And through the key objects from the Royal Collection, 
and the Royal Archives, including paintings, letters, decorative objects. The online exhibition, which is called Making History, Shakespeare and the Royal Family, investigates the tangible effect of royal patronage on the afterlives of Shakespeare's plays. So the third exhibition that we're going to look at, um, this one is actually an online platform. So there are numerous exhibitions in this platform, but this is for the University of Edinburgh. So the collections there are packed full of stories just waiting to be told. So in partnership with the university's digital library and Centre for Research Collections teams, COGAP, we've created a flexible online exhibitions platform that empowers the teams to create unique digital exhibitions that capture the imagination. So this one is a template where multiple exhibitions can be made using deep zoom imagery, which we'll see across all three of the projects, um, interactive slow looking experiences and deep dive storytelling. The university's breadth of knowledge is expressed in an elegant user interface. So let's explore the immersive features these sites offer to online visitors using traditional web interface technologies, which are accessible to the majority of people simply by having a device and an internet connection. So firstly, deep zoom images. High resolution imagery is displayed really prominently in all three of these exhibitions. It's key. You can imagine any visitor to any exhibition, the the main thing people want to do is see things, um, and particularly with art exhibitions, but this is one um, example from Shakespeare in the Royal Collection, where it's a mixture in that exhibition of objects, antiquities, letters, diaries, all sorts of things. Um, and the deep zoom images are central to all of that. So every image on every collection has zoomable um, tools. You can put it into full screen, you can read really deep dive. So on the left here is the full image, which is in situ on the page. And on the right is a detail from um, a zoom, just a screenshot of a zoom that I did yesterday. So a visitor is able to examine the objects at such high res resolution. And this one's a really nice example because it's a satirical send up of George III and his situation and Queen Catherine and many, many things going on in this picture. And But without being able to really detail, see those words, look at the pictures on the wall, see that that's a um, flag of the United or painting of the United Kingdom in tatters on the wall in the right corner there. So many satirical details that the artist was hoping to make his points with would be lost. And even in the galleries, getting that close to something to really explore those details and, and have someone lead you through those details is really quite rare. So this is one of the examples where actually zooming right in on images and if this was a painting to see the cracks in the oil is something that is beyond the experience that you can have in the gallery. Um, all of these images that I'm going to show you today are served by a IIIF, which a lot of you I'm sure will know about. So the International Image Interoperability, Interoperability Framework. My colleague Tristan Roddice that's at the conference is going to absolutely kill me for trying to say that in such a terrible way. But he is a IIIF expert. So if you want to know anything, please find him at The Hague and he will happily chew your ear off about IIIF. So um, these exhibitions, the IIIF images are served via a manifest that can then be made publicly accessible in order for other people to use those works and remix those in a different way. And it depends on copyright and attributions about that, about which ones are available. But they all use the same cookie cutter format and technologies, which means that um, we're not reinventing the wheel every time we want to um, serve images up onto exhibitions like these. So each exhibition has this as sort of the first thing that we do really is concentrate on the deep zoom imagery. Another feature that we have that we've used um, for a few museums, one notably was the Clifford Steel Museum over in Denver, um, used this extensively, um, is slow looking. So this is something that we use here with the University of Edinburgh on, um, they've chosen to use it on one of their exhibitions that focuses on mindfulness. 
So this is an immersive online experience and it shows that a site visitor can sort of sit back, enjoy the collection image as it slowly pans around in fantastic detail. So it's more of a passive experience. Um, it provides an opportunity to pause and really appreciate the beauty of a given object from the collection. And this I'm actually going to try and play you a video now to just show you this in action. So the exhibition in question is called Art in Mind and it invites um, contributors, lots of people who work at the University of Edinburgh, students and other associates to look in detail at artworks that they really love. So I'm going to just click this and hope we can play. I'll just play um, a minute or so of this for you. I love plants mm. and I've always wanted, I love ferns. I, it was sort of reminding me of when I was young and going on holiday in the north of Scotland I used to run through the ferns in the summer. Uh, uh, and then yeah. more recently, been up in Perthshire in the autumn yeah. when they're turning brown mm. and you know the colours that they turn and ferns for me are just an indication of renewal yeah all the time you know because they do die back but they're always mm. they always come back they're reborn whatever way you want to say it yeah yeah so that's that's part of the reason I picked that picture in the first place but, ah. and I just I just feel really connected to it yeah even more now it's, I'm quite emotional there I actually feel like mm. quite emotional just talking about that yeah yeah and noticing how the mind has this mm -hmm. extraordinary capacity for association yeah and how it can take us to places it's yeah it's the most amazing a connection there is you know how my feet were I, I still I'm amazed at that yeah because uh, that was what I noticed yeah uh, yeah really interesting that way we might almost be mirroring what we can see and yes. what we can see mirrors what we feel and although there's a a structure down the middle that appears to be more solid than the other parts yeah I suppose it's like the spine and my, my back did relax mm. during everything as well. So yeah, yeah. I don't feel as tense now <laughs> since it's been a few um, mm. Just head back to the slides. So that makes me feel so peaceful, like I need a nap. Uh, so there are um, motivations behind that that are sort of introducing mindfulness with art and close inspection. And the quote there is just lovely, isn't it? Like the amazing skill that it must take to have drawn that fern leaf in that detail. Um, so slow looking is something that I'll put, there is a link at the end of the slides. All you need is a link to a Drift IF manifest and then you could do your own slow looking. Um, so University of Edinburgh use that selectively um, and obviously a, something like an exhibition focusing on mindfulness and in interacting with art in a mindful way is the perfect place for that. So next I'm going to show you the concept of a story, um, customizable stories. So what we have here are triple IF deep zoom images in the same way that people can zoom in and out. Um, of the objects on the exhibition pages, but this sort of takes it one step further by allowing annotations and that sort of tailored annotations where you can click through a story um, in order to be focused on the right part of the image um, at the right time. So this one is a newspaper article about the first performance of Giselle in Paris. Um, and obviously presented with that image at first, that's quite intimidating. There's not many of us, I, well, certainly not, I wouldn't be able to read a full article in French, but also the denseness of the text um, and really just the way in, and that's sort of what I mean by accessibility in this way, the way into this object is quite hard. There's uh, not sort of inviting ways in to approaching this newspaper article. So what the use of stories does is give you the annotation box you can see up there. So this involves no coding, anyone um, 
that could operate a computer and write some words, uh, sensible words, would be able to create a story like this. So you get to choose your annotation point and then your focal point on the next step when you say, and let's look at the bottom right hand corner of the picture, we then zoom in onto that corner. So I'll show you one in action here, which goes back to um, the picture from Shakespeare in the Royal Collection that I showed you earlier, um, which takes us through the details of that picture. So here's the page for the object on in the exhibition. So we're in the section two of the exhibition. Um, here's the object. So we can look at this image in situ in great detail uh, independently. So that allows somebody who is familiar with the image or just wants to have a quick look to be able to come in and operate it in the way that they're happy with. But what this is really um, nicely doing is offering that docent or tour experience that you might be able to get in the gallery. So like I say, this can be completely created by anyone without having to do any code. So we click through, we're told about some details of the clothing that people are wearing, move down to um, details on basket that I hadn't even noticed the basket, let alone the writing on it before I did this. I mentioned earlier the shredded map above the door, burglar's tools, really um, getting symbolism in here towards Queen Charlotte with a money bag. I mean, that would absolutely go over my head. Um, and pictures covering the back wall. So really satirical digs at the royals of the time and previous royals. Um, details of which would not necessarily be apparent to someone exploring their picture on their own. So there's beauty in this for the user because they're being led around the image. But there's also beauty in this for the creator, um, the editor or the curator, because it can be made so easily um, and it, it just point and click and type your caption onto the next one, onto the next one. And they are really, really quick to do. So I'll go back to my slide now. Um, so Shark makes use of stories and so does Giselle. Um, and I think the University of Edinburgh may do as well, but it's um, definitely one that can be a feature inside the exhibition. So it doesn't need to be um, the main focus but really it can bring, bring those things to life. And somehow with a guided tour, if you're trying to do that with audio or video as well, it's it's less um, lightweight on the production side, even recording this today, it's like setting up a video recording and checking your audio and all those things. Typing some captions really feels like something we could do as part of an editorial workflow in quite a light touch way, but it gives someone everything they need to navigate and understand the image in a really useful way. So let's try, there we are, go back to full screen. So next, sticking with the story of the mad King George III from um, the Shakespeare in the Royal Collection, we can see a timeline here. So this is a screenshot of a timeline on that site. So the timeline in this sense weaves together the chronology and relevance of Shakespeare's works with the story of the royal family, but also significant events at the time. So this exhibition is very, um, it's very key to understand temporally what's happening, who was peers with who, when the play came out and how um, the royals were at the time, but also when um, someone is on the throne, what performances of Shakespeare were happening at the Globe that you could then read um, into connections between those. So the timeline here was key. Um, and it's, and again, simple to use in the CMS, adding snippets of content and jump links in there to the, to the point of um, the exhibition that references this era. So it's a nice way to tie together and essentially offer a different view of the exhibition content. It's really hard to imagine, I think, a 3D or augmented reality experience offering this information in such a clear way. Um, again, we've seen timelines previously in 3D environments where you jump forward and back, but in order to um, really get a sense of the, uh, what is a linear set of information, a timeline, 
I think the 2D um, rendering really quite does it a favour. It simplifies what is quite a complicated concept of things to get your head around. So we heard earlier some audio for the slow looking where we were looking in detail at the fern picture. There's also audio in the Glitch Giselle project. And I wanted to show this because it's just a simple um, sound cloud um, embed, that's what I mean. So in the CMS, there's a field and it says audio and you put your sound cloud link in there and voila, op pops, op pops a player like this. And you can see the G in the background. So it's been branded, lightly branded um, to fit with Giselle. And it's just a quick and easy way to get audio onto your site that is really usable. SoundCloud have obviously um, spent a lot of time and energy making a nice usable and friendly interface for playing audio. What we don't wanna do is sort of redesign that. So as the quickest possible implementation, of audio in an exhibition, a SoundCloud link and embedded player like this works really nicely. So of course, also video. Now video is something that in a 3D experience could be tricky. I think navigating to it is part of the tricky problem, but then balancing the user interaction when you're trying to design something that you could click on a wall and see an image, but you could click on a wall and see a video and signaling to someone that that's gonna happen. And do you try and play it still in the virtual reality space or do you pop them out of that? I think that's all quite, can be quite complicated. So video is peppered throughout all three exhibitions, as you can imagine, we saw the fern earlier. Um, and it's just a lovely way, again, of in a gallery, you may need to put a big screen up on a wall and have people in a dark room and keep it away from everything else so that it's not interacting with everything. Um, but, the 2D website exhibition digital format just means that it's so at home. So of course there's a video, of course it's in the page, of course if I click play, I can make it full screen really easily. So it's just a lovely home um, for audio and video. So one other thing I wanted to show specifically, and this one is from the University of Edinburgh online collection platform, is the levels of navigation. So I mentioned right at the beginning about handheld tours around an exhibition and how you would go in gallery to get and you'd have to turn up at the right time to get a tour or you might use an audio tour and then you can't really talk to anyone else about what you're seeing and, and you haven't really got control over the stops. Um, what's really nice about putting digital exhibitions online on websites is you can have levels of navigation. So at the top there, this is a two different navigation layouts for the same exhibition. So the first one has a previous and next. So if I am browsing and want a gentle journey through an exhibition, or perhaps I don't feel that comfortable with the subject matter, and it might be a nice thing for someone who does know what they're talking about to lead me through it. We've got this previous and next big fat pit state button on your phone, you tap, 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 or on your laptop, you click there, and you're taken to the next objects that make sense in that linear view. However, they also on the page, we also present for them an exploration of the exhibition. So there's an option there to explore by seeing um, everything that is available in the exhibition and you can dive in on your own. If you're someone that is particularly interested in the, the um, ship itself and the vessel itself rather than the journeys it makes then you go from warship to research vessel it's ways in and i think it's about meeting the user where they are so this is all simple stuff that i'm sure many of you have seen and heard and done many times but i think it's worth remembering that there's a, there is a real distinction between um, holding someone's hand through steps of something in a way that you are prescribing their journey, which can definitely be welcome, particularly to a more amateur visitor, versus allowing someone to explore in their own right. And that might be because that's how they like to do it, or it might be because they know exactly what they need to find. So another thing that we see here on Shakespeare and the Royal Collection is a 3D visualization. So now I'm talking about 3D being good, yay. I don't think 3D is bad. But I think 3D navigation can be really quite difficult. So 3D visualization here, we've got a recreation of St. George's Hall, I believe in Wind's Palace. Um, 
as it was in 1857, when the royals would put on uh, plays there to entertain one another, but also send up some characters from their uh, ancestry. So this is a little screen grab of a 3D model. So you can spin this around and you can see where behind the stage, what that looks like. You can see the roof of the hall. It's very cool. You should have a look. Um, but I think 3D visualizations is an amazing way to bring to life your objects, um, particularly sculpture, of course, um, and antiquities. Any 3D object really benefits from that. And I think seeing that in a 2D interface is ideal because I don't want to worry about how I get to it or where I'm going to go after. I want to have a look at the object. So 3D visualizations of objects or 3D scans um, can be a lovely thing. So of all the features that I've talked about, I wanted to just sort of start to sum up by absolutely acknowledging the accessibility needs of the policies involved, as in we have to meet these um, criteria, not just to tick a box with the policy, but to make things truly accessible for as many people as possible with all sorts of different impairments that um, can arise and, of course, affect all of us. Sometimes it's noisy where you are. Sometimes you haven't got time to like find this stuff. And that's the main thing, really, that I think accessibility absolutely has to empower people that may be suffering with any sort of disability, but it actually helps us all. Best practice in accessibility is really just best practice in web design. So the policy side of it is one area, but there's also the usability. So this is where I've been coming to really today is that I think it's just inherently more usable for the vast majority of the population right now to be using 2D web interfaces rather than AR or VR or 3, 3D spaces. People are familiar with it. It may not be cutting edge in the same way, but I think it can open up content to people in a way that those other technologies at the moment cannot. Production wise, so by that I mean the cookie cutter nature of it. I feel like there are massive opportunities for non-technical people to start creating more engaging content as part of online exhibitions. Um, the Edinburgh exhibition system I've showed you is a perfect example of that, where they can make an exhibition about anything. They can pull slow looking in when they want. They can pull the, pull the clickable stories in when they want. Deep zoom images all over the shop. Here's the audio, here's the video. Brilliant, package it up. And that goes live without a developer getting involved at all. And then they can do it again for something else. And taking it down a step, each feature like the slow looking or the clickable stories can be made um, using completely reproducible code. So we don't, you don't need to code anything. The code is done once and now it's over to the people who can tell the amazing stories to create more and more of them. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, of course, access is another issue. So the hardware, the software involved is much more attainable um, to many, many more people than some of the more leading and cutting edge technologies that we see out there. So to finish up, there's a few links here, and this is really just for um, your use later. So have a look. Uh, there's links here to how you can make the stories yourself, how you can um, put an image from IIIF image into slow looking in essentially one click. All the sites I've shown you today use Craft CMS, which is something that also my colleague Tristan can talk to you about. Um, Triple IF and for us at COGAP, there's a link. And the case studies themselves, so the three sites, I want to say thank you very much to our clients for letting me run, run through these with you. So I'm afraid I'm not there in person, um, but any questions you may have, my colleague Tristan Roddis is at The Hague and he would love to speak to you. And if you have any questions or feedback or um, ideas for more lovely 2D online exhibition features, please let us know. Thank you very much. Tristan is here to answer your questions. Um, let me maybe start to you with, there was a question from Julie. Uh, have any user studies or analytics been conducted in relation to these uh, features and can the results be accessed somewhere? So uh, thanks for the question, Julie. It's a, a very good one. Uh, the answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, we track the analytics for each of the institutions 
but generally it is, it's up to the uh, media managers of the, the three uh, different sites to interpret those results. It's a great suggestion though, and um, yeah, we, it's, we, we absolutely should look across all three of them. And I, I know we use Google Tag Manager to track individual events so that yes, we can tell when people do click on the guided tours or the zoomable images and so on. And absolutely, it would be great to get a breakdown of uh, yeah how, how much these features are used because you know as, as Louise says, part of this is about providing just a, a very deliberately traditional view. These are just web pages that you can load up on your phone and so on. But part of it is about sending people off into individual experiences, whether that's watching the videos, doing the guided tours, doing the deep zoom images. Uh, and yeah, we, we sh absolutely should compare across all three and see whether we can, um, you know, in a way, back up our hunches that combining these two things is a good thing with, with real data. So yeah, we will try to do that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was also curious, um, and maybe you answered this already, but I just wanted to ask again, um, if there were any um, kind of resources or studies that you looked at that kind of inspired these specific features to be built, like, for example, the decision making uh, between making 3D visualizations kind of um, ideally for objects as opposed to navigation. I just thought that was a really interesting decision. And I was just wondering if there had been uh, if you had maybe referred to another study that had been conducted or if you had conducted your own study kind of um, before that, maybe with interviews or workshops or something like that. Um, so again, I'd say it, it, there wasn't anything specific in terms of one particular study. I think it was more when we were developing these sites in partnership with the, the, the various clients, then we would be discussing the pros and cons. And as Louise mentioned, you know, in, I think the early days of the pandemic and everybody at home, there's a sort of a, a, a quick flowering of like online exhibitions. And every there were a lot of people who seemed to be trying to replicate the in-gallery experience. And we felt actually a bit underwhelmed about it, you know, ourselves. So I think it was more, it was a lot more subjective than empirical, um, but it was the case that in, in all cases, the clients agreed that they would prefer to go down this direction of, of traditional web pages with interactive features rather than trying to create a whole experience that, that either replicated or somehow subsumed it um, in some sort of AR, VR, uh, you know, whizzy environment where, it, yeah, I, I, I think, we felt it was a bit too much about you, that you, you end up focusing on the technology that is doing the presenting the information rather than the information itself. Okay, yeah, thank you. Super interesting. I definitely agree. I just thought it was a really cool decision. And thanks for uh, telling us how you came to it. Thank you for your question, Billy. Um... Yes, we also, um, Julie um, is our user uh, experience designer, so she's uh, super interested and uh, exhibitions in European are one of the you know, highlights um, of the platform. We, we're really interested in how, um, how to make it as accessible for uh, the vast majority of users. So I'm Super happy to hear Louise taking a case for the simplified navigation and the focus on images. And we have another question from Grita. I hope I'm not mispronouncing you. Um, have you also used AAAF with audiovisual content or only with pictures? Uh, so in these three cases, it's only images. So we, we use Triple F extensively for the slow looking features, um, you know, the thumbnails that you get before you uh, necessarily interact with them, uh, especially on mobile. And then for things like both the, the guided tours, the stories as uh, we call them, and the, the slow looking where it can kind of go full screen and just pan around. So. We use images extensively, but no, the short answer is we, we don't use IIIF 
uh, APIs to represent the video or the three D objects yet. Um, and mainly, we you know mainly it's a question of how much we use. As in, in all cases, we extensively use images, and we know that all clients will want those for the video and three D um, features that again are present. There, there's a lot fewer of them than there are for for the images. So it's a question of sort of is is it worth us uh, supporting the standards? We'd absolutely love to, but it, it feels like we need uh, almost a critical mass of data of that format, audio, visual, or three D, to start really engaging with with other presentation mechanisms. I hope that answers your question. Later. Uh, if someone wants to ask a question, don't, you don't only have to use chat, please just unmute yourself and shout. Um, so actually, I've got one question here that, that came in um, through a direct message uh, from Catherine Staplin in New York. Uh, and she's asking, how are the exhibitions integrated with collections? Um, jumping directly from object page to moment within the exhibition would be uh, great to see. So uh, the, the answer is, again, at the moment, at least, almost all of them are uh, integrated in a very one way direction. So the idea is you start with the exhibition, you would maybe see uh, an interactive uh, photograph of uh, a particular artwork or similar. And then you would have a prominent link that would say view more about this in the online collection. So it would take people out of the exhibition to see the object. What we don't have yet is the, the 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 reverse links because that would be a great way to do this and to join up all that information so that if somebody was just searching an institution's online collection comes across an object that's featured in the exhibition, then it would prominently say you can see more about this in this particular exhibition, um, and that's something we've done for other clients, but not in these three examples. So it's a, it's strictly a one way send people off to the online collection rather than the round tripping, which would be the, the ideal. I don't see any more hands, so I'm gonna maybe ask some questions too. Uh, I was, uh, so the three examples that, that uh, Luis shared uh, were quite different uh, in what, um, in the experience of the users, but were they uh, prepared with the same um, CMS or was that uh, completely three different systems? Uh, how do you, yeah, how do you work with the, the clients and like uh, preparing that? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. And yeah, the, the answer is they are all the same content management system. So they're, they're all using craft CMS. Um, and what we've done is, is configure it to be in a way as flexible as possible. So in all cases under the hood, they're just building up a page of different components. So they might have a component that is a Zoomable image and they'll paste an image URL and then it will be displayed, as you point out, differently according to you know, the graphic design will end up different. They'll have a, a component that will be you know, text with heading, another component that might be then a, a link to a story, a link to a connect collection object. So all of them have exactly the same style of data under the hood and they all use the exact same content management system but then we we change the, the layout um, and often in a way the, the interface uh, a lot as well I mean glitch Giselle is a, a deliberately uh, crazy interface and uh, you know yeah feels very different from the other two uh, but underneath it they're all using exactly the same as craft CMS with different components to allow this sort of flexible storytelling where or flexible narratives of for individual pages of an exhibition, it could be extremely sparse and just you know, literally a bit of text and a static image, or it could be extremely rich as in interweaving video and 3D and guided tours and so on and so on. And it's really up to the content editors, how they craft, no pun intended, the content um, and then we, we've obviously created different interfaces to, to give each one their, their own identity or to match the brand identities of um, the other institutions. That's great. That's extremely flexible. Um, 
I'm gonna check again if someone would like to ask the question, please. Uh, there's a function I think to raise your hand. But, um, you can use the chat. And if not, then I have more questions <laughs> because as a exhibition coordinator, uh, that's that's exactly what you know interests me. Um, so um, okay, so the the uh, those exhibitions um, that were shared, they are like um, browser ready. So like you you just like you access the uh, the website. Uh, are they also optimize for the mobile or is that not part of the experience uh, yes absolutely so uh, as louise mentioned you know part of the idea of these is that they can be used in gallery as well and people can use them for you know linking to further information and i think in some cases they they are explicitly linked to a physical exhibition and then there's the the online version uh, so there's that flexibility to do both the the, the one caveat, I suppose, is that some experiences work better um, on different platforms. But so the, the use of video, for example, it's obviously it's fine. It can be done on both, but your mobile, you're only going to see it as big as the screen. Things like the guided tours. Absolutely. Yes, those work on mobile as well. But what we have to do there is um, rather than embed them in the page so much, it's more like you enter in that experience that takes over the whole mobile view and then when you exit it you go back to the page so there's a fair amount of thought you have to do about how use with mobile will will differ but yes absolutely our aim is to have as as we mentioned you know the most accessible site and that's accessible in terms of usable on different devices there are um when it comes to sort of you know web accessibility there's there's very good questions about the uh, things like um, video and you know whether those should always include closed captions. There's things like the guided tours and images, and again, how do you convey that in text only? And, and so there, there are certain things that we don't do, and we know we don't do. But in general, yes, we we certainly want to support both desktop and mobile, and to try to provide an intuitive experience for both, and and crucially, access to every feature. Um, even if it behaves slightly differently. Thank you. Yeah, that's always a, that's always a challenge to how the people are going to access you know, the um, the stuff that we are creating and uh, how to make it as comfortable for them. While it's impossible to cater to all the devices and all you know all the browsers, everything. Um, uh, I'm going to ask again. Please raise your hands. Uh, don't be shy. <laughs> we're not biting. Um, I had a thought that I lost uh, for a second when you were mentioning the, um, ah, I know, uh, the, the mobile. Uh, are, so the, uh, the exhibitions were, all three exhibitions were linked to the physical one? I don't know if I maybe missed that. Uh, no, so in general, they were online exhibitions only. I think in the case of the uh, Royal Collections, there might have been an, a physical exhibition for, for one of the online ones. So these generally were, if you like, sort of natively digital exhibitions, but that also could be linked to a physical one if, if um, the need arise. And again, this was part of it was the all three projects happened during the pandemic. And so it, the, really our brief was, how can we get, create compelling digital exhibitions and in a way, once things reopened and they were able to start doing physical exhibitions, then they had the opportunity to link the two. But what this did mean is that the, the whole curatorial work and of providing exhibitions could continue even in a time when all physical access was restricted. And do you think that's, um, yeah, that's, uh, there was a similar case also in, uh, in Europeana, like uh, we made so many more ex digital exhibitions during the pandemic. Um, but uh, is do you know uh, if the clients are keeping the exhibitions like permanently online, or um, is that going to be something that uh, there are going to be more online exhibitions, um, or is was it just a pandemic moment? 
Uh, no, absolutely. They they plan to keep keep all of the existing ones online and to expand it going forward. So, uh, yeah, it, it absolutely wasn't. It, it was created in response to the pandemic, but it absolutely isn't the idea that this was just for the pandemic. Um, if, as far as I know, uh, they're, they're very happy with the systems and are continuing to add to them to this day. So I would certainly imagine that they, they will just continue to use them but in a way now also have the option to link them to a physical one as well. But um, certainly I don't think they would go back so much to just doing physical ones now that they have this mechanism to provide all that information and crucially provide supplementary information online. A lot of these things you can't fit on a wall label or anything else. And so they, they work in a very complementary manner. Thank you so much, Tristan, for being here. Um... And yeah, being being able to answer uh, all the questions. This was a very inspiring uh, presentation, and we're very happy to uh, to feature it. Thank you again, and have a lovely afternoon.